All right. Today we're looking at uh, Augustus and the Empire. This is uh, just taking place right after the assassination of Caesar. And uh, we're looking at the time period here from uh, 31 BC to 14 AD. What's happened is uh, Caesar has been assassinated. And um, well, there's a bit of a, a calm here. Uh, people aren't really sure, there's more shock. People aren't really sure or what to do. Uh, the assassins were kind of in fear for a while. Um, and what happens is that um, they allow some people to speak about Caesar. They had his body, but they allow him to be to have a funeral. And this begins to turn the tide um, against the assassins. It's announced that uh, Caesar has a, a will, and he's given a lot of money. Each citizen will receive money. And um, it also announces a new heir. It's not Brutus. It's going to be Octavian, his nephew Octavian. Uh, what happens is you will see a second triumvirate form. Um, some, some men forming that they feel like they need to take care of these assassins. The second triumvirate, uh, Mark Anthony, Caesar's right-hand man, the man who was supposed to be his bodyguard at, during the assassination, he uh, will have command of the legions. Caesar's legions are still in form, in, intact, and so he will take over those legions. Octavian now is named his heir. And so Octavian, this, he's very young, he's in his 20s here, and uh, he will be brought in. He wants to defend his, his uncle and his inheritance. And then Lepidus, uh, a pretty powerful senator. So these guys will form a behind the scenes originally, a triumvirate. And then they will gradually be able to sway the city of Rome against the assassins. And the assassins will be run out of town. So this becomes uh, the goal of the second triumvirate, to uh, get revenge on these assassins. And they have Caesar's legions, and the assassins will gather their legions, and you'll have a fight. The fight will take place over in Greece. It'll be the Battle of Philippi between the second triumvirate and the, uh, the armies of the assassins. 42 BC, again, they go over to Greece. Not good to fight in Italy, so they will go over to Greece. And it's Mark Anthony and Octavian and their Caesar's old legions versus the assassins. Cassius, the leader of the assassins, and Brutus is there also. And it's a tough fought battle, and uh, in the end, Cassius and Brutus are defeated, and they'll end up committing suicide, and they're done. It's the revenge on the assassins. It is done. So the second triumvirate returns to Rome. They are uh, in power now. There's no one else to take power, so these men of the second triumvirate will take power to, again, like the first triumvirate, to control the empire. How do you, again, run this whole show? Octavian this time, in the, in the second triumvirate, uh, he will take Caesar's place, except instead of leaving, he will actually stay in the city of Rome. Again, he's rather young, he's in his 20s, and now he's super rich. He's inherited his uncle's fortune. And uh, Mark Anthony will take off to the east to uh, put down a rebellion over in, over in Asia Minor, and then he'll head down to Egypt. And Lepidus will handle the uh, western side. So this will work for qu quite a ways. I do want to mention there's also a marriage here. There was a marriage here between Octavian's sister, Octavia, and Mark Anthony. So uh, that's to meant, to meant to seal the, uh, uh, the alliance together. And it works for a few years. Until Mark Anthony makes his way down to Egypt, where he is going to hook up with Cleopatra. Again, uh, Caesar had used Cleopatra, and Cleopatra had used Caesar. This one's a little bit different. Mark Anthony, uh, not quite the great politician that Caesar was, maybe uh, thinking too much, or not thinking enough anyway, in what he does, because he falls in love with her. It's the only thing to explain what he does, is that she's going to manipulate him. You know, Caesar had been maybe manipulating her, now she will manipulate Mark Anthony. Uh, he, he actually marries her. And then this might start ringing a bell that this is going to cause a problem, because I just mentioned that Mark Anthony is married to Octavia. And so he will send word now that he is divorcing Octavian's sister, and he has married this Egyptian woman, a real marriage, to a pagan woman, or well, to a, uh, a heathen woman or something. Um, Octavian handles this the way that uh, an Italian man would. His family has been disgraced, and he declares war on not just Mark Anthony, but he's going to be taking on Cleopatra. And so this is something you have to think about. This is taking on a powerful Roman man, much older than you, uh, experienced warrior, and the power of Egypt. Egypt is still a powerful state here, so um, this is going to be a heck of a war. And if you were betting on this, 
I think you'd be betting on these two, uh, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. He's an experienced warrior. She's a powerful woman in control, in control of a powerful state. And uh, where can we fight? Where should we fight? Uh, I think we'll be fighting over in Greece again. Uh, 31 BC, they will send their armies over to Greece. They're, as their armies are getting ready to match up, their navies will actually fight first. And this will decide the whole thing right here, the naval battle. It's the Battle of Actium off the coast of Greece. Uh, Mark Anthony's and Cleopatra's navy, surely to win this, you know. Um, it turns out that Octavian in his 20s, without military experience, has hired some pretty powerful men. He's, he's a pretty smart kid. And he, so he doesn't command in this battle necessarily, but he hired the right guys, and they will, they will win. Octavian's navy will defeat Mark Anthony's navy. And if you uh, follow Shakespeare's story, it has a sad ending to it. Mark Anthony and Cleopatra get separated during the battle, and they make it back to Egypt. And Mark Anthony hears that Cleopatra's dead, so he commits suicide. And Cleopatra, hearing that he's dead, commits suicide. Um, the truth is probably that um, he committed suicide because he'd been disgraced, and she committed suicide rather than fall in the hands of Octavian. So, uh, but anyway, this battle, this Battle of Actium, 31 BC, um, it marks a turning point in history. Uh, the date I want you to memorize is 44 BC, the assassination of Caesar, but it's just 13 years later. 13 years later that you're down to one man again. Um, it is Octavian, the end of the Republic. If you had killed Caesar hoping to return the Republic to power, by 31 BC you're getting something that Caesar could never have dreamed of, a man with more power than anyone could imagine. Octavian returns to Rome the victor, the, the, lone, the lone man uh, in Rome, Lepidus the third of the, tri of the triumvirate, will step aside quietly. Octavian comes back to Rome. He is welcomed as the lone hero for the Romans. They welcome him as Augustus. So we called him Octavian or Octavius before, and now we will start calling him Augustus, which means the exalted one, Octavian the Great, the Great One. But he goes by lots of titles through his career. Other titles include Caesar. He will take his uncle's title as command of the, in his legions and his inheritance from his uncle. So he will go by the title of Caesar, and he will go by the title of Imperator. This will be a military title, um, controlling all the states of Rome, which now we can start calling an empire. This is where the word empire is going to come from, because the Imperator will control all the pieces of this huge puzzle. The title he likes the most, though, is Princep. Um, when he would talk to people in Rome, he would present himself as just the princep, the, the first among equals, you know, the father of a, of a new age. But uh, it's not one that puts me above you. It's one that just, well, we need a leader. Everyone knows we need a leader. And so he'll just take over as the first citizen of Rome. And so actually he would call this the principate, the time when he was the princep, the time when we needed a leader and he stepped up. Uh, but the history books will call it the Empire. 31 BC will be the start of uh, the Roman Empire because the Republic is still there, but it's basically dead at this point. Augustus rules a long time. From 31 BC, when he's in the only man in power, until his death in 1480, he is the lone man. He's the only one with power. And if you do your math there, 31 years and then 14 years, that's about 45 years. He starts in his 20s and he will live to be at least 70. So he has a long time to do this, and this helps that, you know, you get a guy like uh, Alexander the Great who dies in his 30s before he can really establish anything. This guy will establish his things and then have 30 more years beyond that to make sure that everything will last for a, for a long time, for hundreds of years, in fact, what he does here. Here's how he rules. He rules with the Senate. He does not override them. He doesn't um, pack the Senate or declare them uh, null and void, he will rule with them. He will go in front of them and present his ideas and ask for their opinions. And of course, he starts off with uh, them agreeing to anything he says. And then the things that he says work. It's amazing how this works. Uh, if you present ideas and they work, you just follow on. There's no reason to, to block him. The things that he does work. He's a very bright young man. Politically, um, foreign policy-wise, everything he touches turns to gold. And he does his best to respect the traditions. This is what got Caesar in trouble, was insults to the Senate, insult to the old way. Um, Augustus will do his best to talk about tradition, how wonderful the old republic was, and how we got to keep the republic going and all the great traditions, while he changes everything. 
So he talks about republic, as we basically now can start calling this an empire, but he will call it a republic and a principate. But the history books will tell you this is an empire. He's an emperor. And he does this gradually. He doesn't just do it in a couple of months, and that's what got Caesar in trouble, was he will do it over the course of years after years after years, such that the changes are almost imperceptible. But after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, this is just the established way of doing it. No one can remember anything different. While he presents himself as a symbol of order and stability, he doesn't make changes as he's changing things. This is what people want. People want order and stability, especially having come through these civil wars, Marius versus Sulla, Caesar versus Pompey. People want that. And he's a attractive young man. Everything he touches turns to gold, and he seems to just make things happen. He seems to make the right decisions year after year. He also benefits from a thing called Pax Romana. There's not much happening. This means Roman peace. Pax Romana. The Romans have brought peace. The, the whole Mediterranean is basically peaceful now. There's not a whole lot happening. Um, and he will keep the army moving. He'll make a conquest here and there so there can be a triumph and there will be generals and we can still proclaim ourselves warriors. So a few conquests here and there as they will sketch out a 4,000 mile frontier from Europe over to Asia Minor down to Egypt, across North Africa, 4,000 miles of Roman frontiers to cover. And, um, but it's just, there's not much happening. It just so happens that at the time, right around uh, the change from B.C. to A.D., there's just not much happening. No great invasions of, of foreigners coming in. A few small raids. There's always going to be a few trouble areas, and so that keeps, you know, keeps the army on the move and on the watch. And um, it allows him to make the changes he needs. He recognized that there needs to be changes in the army. If you're going to go from civil wars where every general has a private army, we need to stop that. So he will start changing that with the Roman legions. They will now swear an oath to Caesar. And in this case, it means him, but it will also mean the next Caesar and the next Caesar. The army belongs to the Caesar, to the imperator, to control the empire with. One man controlling the armies, not, in, not private armies, but just one army for the entire empire. You'll sign on for 20 years, and you'll be given rights. Um, if you were an Italian, and you didn't quite have the full rights of a Roman, now you will. When you serve in the army, you will come out of it, and your family will now have all the rights of full Roman citizenship. So you'll start seeing this all through the Italian peninsula, Italians serving in the Roman army and getting full rights of Romans. You'll also be given property. This was a problem. If you remember, go back to the Gracchus brothers. Give us back our property. Well, you can. If you'll join the army, now when you come out, you'll have a retirement package for you and your family. You'll be given a piece of property. It's not going to be necessarily where you want it to be, though. They will use this for colonization. You've got a 4,000-mile frontier through Europe and Asia Minor and all through uh, the Middle East. And so they'll use this to kind of plant colonies. Your family will get a piece of property, but it'll be where we want it, where we need it. You're now coming out of this as a war veteran, and your family, your boys, will probably be warriors also. And so we need you in certain places. This will be a way of planting Romans into foreign territory, kind of Romanizing people that way. He also recognized that there just aren't enough Romans, period.